Testing, one, two, testing. Testing, one, two, three, testing. That's pretty good. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. All right, well, good evening, guys. Welcome. Uh, glad that you um, survived the eclipse. Anybody watch the eclipse last week? Yeah, what would you think? Yeah, it was pretty cool. It was uh, better than any picture I'd seen of it. So, so yeah, glad, uh, glad that you all had a chance to do that. So, all right, well, we'll go ahead and get started this evening, get started on time so that we can get you out of here on time. So we just have one announcement tonight. And that is that we're going to have what we call praise night, and that is three weeks from tonight. And so that is a night where we get together and we just get to share the amazing and cool things that God's been revealing to us this year through this whole study of John's gospel. Uh, if you have come to that, you know that it is always one of those times that is worth coming for. And if you've not come to it before, you've always thought, well, it's not really about... 
you are missing out on something really amazing. So that'll be in three weeks. It'll be on Monday, May 6th, and we will start at 7 o'clock as normal. So with that, we will go ahead and start our hymn. And so if you would, go ahead and stand and sing with me as we sing the hymn. Well, it's not working anymore. Ryan, can you advance the slide for me? There we go. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. So it might be a little bit more noisy, but I got the doors open, trying to get a little bit of a cross breeze because it's a little warm in here tonight. So let's go ahead and, and open in prayer. Lord, we are grateful to be here tonight and to study your word and to study this amazing passage and to consider the impacts of the resurrection. Lord, may we see the power that the resurrection has for our lives. Lord, I pray that you speak through me tonight and that... Um, your spirit is working in the lives and hearts of each man present and each person listening to uh, this lecture. Lord, thank you for Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Okay, so as we uh, begin, I always like to start with a question. And the question for tonight is, as you look back on your life, what are, would you say are some of the key moments of your life? Maybe it was a degree, like uh, a graduation. Maybe it was getting married, the birth of a child, the birth of a grandchild. Maybe it was a job, a promotion. Maybe getting baptized. Perhaps those moments actually aren't positive. Maybe you look back at a huge failure, a divorce a diagnosis, or even death of a loved one. Everyone has those key moments in life that, in retrospect, change them in profound ways, and it changed the direction of their lives. Now, sometimes we go back to those moments and we replay them and relive them over and over, and we can even get stuck there. And so when that happens, those key moments then become defining moments, forming the foundation of our identity. You think of yourself as the guy that earned this or accomplished that, or maybe you see yourself as the guy who failed and was disgraced. Now, we don't usually go and say these things out loud. We don't say, hi, I'm Scott. I'm the guy who defines myself based on such and such an event. We don't do that but we think that way. Is there anyone who has not had some defining moment in their life, positive or negative? And the more we dwell on these defining moments, the more they become who we are, our identity. What moments define your identity? Pause and just take a quick moment to think about it. 
What of your life events define you? Now tonight, we're really not here to talk about the defining moments in our lives, but actually a defining moment in world history. A moment that redefines all other moments in world history and in our personal history. And so, of course, I'm talking about the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Yes, Jesus' death was also a defining moment when he paid for our sins to justify us. And I'm not trying to split hairs to say one is more important than the other. You need both. You can't have a resurrection without a death. But without a resurrection, what makes Jesus' death any different than all other deaths? Jesus' resurrection to maybe adapt the catchphrase of a famous pastor, changes everything. So our outline tonight is going to come in three divisions. The resurrection changes death. The resurrection changes people. And the resurrection changes the way. The resurrection changes death, that's John 20, verses 1 to 10. The resurrection changes people, John 20, verses 11 to 19, and the resurrection changes the way, John 20, verses 30 to 31. So please open your Bibles or turn them on and read along with me as I begin to read in verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter to reach the tomb first. And can't you just hear John kind of saying, old man? I can. I can just, just getting a dig in on Peter. He bent over and looked at in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along right behind him, and he went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. But they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So we see that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early with at least two other women. We know that there were other women there for two reasons. The other Gospels tell us so, and when she goes to report to Peter, she says, we, we don't know where they have put them. They were taking spices that they had prepared. Maybe they thought that that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus did it wrong. Maybe they were just so grieved that they just needed to do something to show their love and appreciation for Jesus. And as they were going, they certainly were not expecting the tomb to be open, let alone for Jesus to be resurrected. And so when they saw that the tomb was open, they assumed it was grave robbers. They ran to tell Peter and John, who ran to go see for themselves, and when they got there, they find the linen strips and the face cloth. John recorded that he believed, but he admits that he still didn't realize that the scripture had to be fulfilled. Now, why do we care about these details? Why are these details important? Well, first off, none of the disciples nor the women were expecting Jesus to be resurrected. It was literally the last thing on their mind. The resurrection was not some story that the disciples had prefabricated to keep the movement going, to keep the dream alive. The linen wrappings were left in place. Now, from Matthew's account, we know that uh, Pilate had posted a Roman guard to guard the tomb because they were afraid of someone taking the body. No grave robber would take the time to unwrap a dead body that is under guard and then rearrange the linen before making off with a naked body. The chief priest paid off the guards to say, well, the disciples stole Jesus' body, but that just doesn't add up. The disciples were not expecting this. 
So conclusion is that Jesus really and truly was resurrected from the dead and no other plausible explanation exists. It's a historical fact and a certainty. Okay, so what's the big deal about the resurrection being a fact that we know that it's true? Well, if Jesus had only died, if he had not been resurrected, then how would we know for sure that he had paid for our sins? Perhaps Jesus had some secret sin no one knew about. Perhaps Jesus died to pay for his own sin. You see, the resurrection tells us for certain that Jesus died for our sins. He paid for our debt, and God accepted it. The resurrection gives us confidence that our debt really has been paid in full. On the cross, when Jesus cried out, to tell us die, the resurrection is the Father's agreement to Jesus' claim. Without the certainty of the resurrection, we could have no certainty that we have been justified. But now that we know Jesus was resurrected, we know that our sins are removed by faith. Therefore, we no longer need to fear death. Jesus has defeated death, and death has lost its sting. So Jesus' resurrection changes death and takes away its sting, and that is our first principle. Jesus' resurrection changes death and takes away its sting. You know, a couple of years ago when I was diagnosed with cancer, I was immediately afraid. There was this dread and fear that followed me everywhere and it impacted every moment of my life. It took me a number of months to finally admit that I was afraid of dying. I was very afraid. You know, I've been a Christian, I've been a follower of Jesus my entire adult life, and I said that I didn't fear death. But it came, when it came right down to it, and I realized that I was facing real death, I was absolutely terrified. And it was a fear that I could not shake. I hid it from most people, but it grew and grew. And then last summer, I sort of hit rock bottom, as they say. I totally and completely freaked out. The test numbers were going all the wrong ways. The doctors were using words that I really didn't like. I was constantly tearing up, even depressed. But why? Why was I so afraid of dying? Sure, I don't want to leave my family, but it was more than that, much more. I realized that I really wasn't sure if I had done enough. What if I died and I didn't have enough faith? What if I hadn't performed well enough? What if I went before Jesus and he says, away from me because I never knew you? I doubted whether all my sins were really covered. Maybe my really bad ones weren't covered. I thought that there had to be more that I should have done, but hadn't. Mind you, I never said any of these things out loud. I don't know if these thoughts ever rose to my conscious thoughts, but they were there in the background the whole time, whispering to me. And every morning when I woke up, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I even began to wonder if my faith in Jesus was a complete waste of time. My faith truly was shaken. Maybe Christianity wasn't true. Maybe there was no God. The thought of facing death without knowing what was on the other side haunted me. I got together with a couple of my friends and I pretty much just wept. It was a mixture of fear and grief and embarrassment that I was not stronger. If you would have seen me, you would never have listened to another one of my lectures. But then I began listening to some podcasts and some teaching on the gospel that began to build my faith back together, brick by brick, as it were. And the capstone of the rebuilding of my faith was the resurrection. The Holy Spirit showed me 
that because of the certainty of Jesus' resurrection, all my sins were forgiven. Because of the certainty of Jesus' resurrection, I too will be resurrected. Because of the resurrection, I have real hope in the face of real death. Now, I don't think I'm the only one that's gone through this. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 15. But if it's preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we've testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And that's where I was. I had not assured myself that the resurrection was true. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Because of the resurrection, we have real hope in the face of death, real hope in the face of divorce, real hope in the face of anything. Real hope, period. What is it that is rocking your world today? What is shaking you to your core? What has you secretly in despair and in tears? I hope you see that Jesus' resurrection is the hope that you've been looking for. Because Jesus lives, we will live. Jesus' resurrection is proof that all the promises of God are true. Jesus' resurrection changes death and takes away its sting. Let's continue reading in verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look inside the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there but didn't realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So now in our narrative, the story returns to Mary Magdalene and she is still in despair. She, st- she sees angels but doesn't even realize it. Jesus' missing body has just torn open the grief that she had over his death all over, and she can't see anything through her tears except her loss. Jesus appears to her, but she doesn't recognize him either until he calls her name. Mary cries out, teacher, and then clings to him with all of her strength. And I just picture in my mind those those videos you've seen on the internet of when a soldier comes home from being overseas for a long time and he surprises his family and when they they see him, they're overjoyed and they run and they cling to him and they weep and they won't let go. But Jesus tells her not to cling to him because he still needs to ascend to his father. Jesus gives her a message for his brothers. He's ascending to his father and theirs, his God and theirs. And Mary immediately obeys. You can hear the joy in her voice as she says, I have seen the Lord. 
As I read this, I wondered why Jesus told Mary not to cling to him. I mean, she obviously loves him. What, what's the harm? Well, as I study this, commentators are not really in agreement on exactly why Jesus said this. But it seems that Jesus is telling Mary that his physical presence was for a limited time. He is ascending. But Jesus says that his relationship is changing with his, father, or his followers in two ways. First, Jesus is ascending and returning to the Father, which he has already told them. He told them this at the Last Supper. So he would no longer relate to them on a physical level, but on a spiritual level through the Holy Spirit. Secondly, Jesus calls the disciples his brothers. He is a new kind of man a resurrected man, and his followers one day will be like him, glorified and resurrected. Now Jesus says that the relationship between the Father and the disciples is also changing. God is no longer just Jesus' follower and God. He is now the disciples' father and God too. And I think Paul helps us understand how that change has happened. In Galatians 4, 4. But when the set time had fully come, God has sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who cries out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are God's child, God has also made you an heir. So this is yet another aspect of how Jesus called the disciples his brothers. This also makes us brothers with one another. We are now part of the same family of God. So because of the resurrection, those who believe in Jesus have a changed relationship with God and each other. Let's continue reading in verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, then they are not forgiven. So that same night, Jesus mysteriously appears to the confused and fearful disciples in a locked room. Jesus gives them a new mission in life. It's the same mission the Father had given him to go out and proclaim that the kingdom of God has come. Now to accomplish their mission, Jesus breathes on them to give them the Holy Spirit, the source of their power. And Jesus seems to give them authority to forgive sins or retain them. Now there are two things that are clear about this passage and one thing that is less so. First, Jesus gives the disciples a new purpose in life to go proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Whatever they saw their purpose for living before, Jesus has changed it. Now most of us, you and I, we live to make ourselves comfortable and secure, even pleasurable and pain-free. But Jesus has made those purposes secondary. The primary purpose of our life is now to share the gospel. This means that the disciples will sacrifice their comfort and security to meet their primary purpose from Jesus. You know, Paul added later in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, and for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, What have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And that's the way a lot of us live. 
But Jesus has changed that. The second thing that's pretty clear is that Jesus has given the disciples a new power to fulfill their new purpose, and that is the Holy Spirit. Now, they didn't feel the power right then, not yet anyways, but Jesus breathes on them to prepare them to receive the Holy Spirit, which would come in about 50 days at Pentecost. So the source of the power in their life has changed. No longer do they rely on themselves to know what to say, how to say it, when to say it, what to do. No longer do they rely on their own power to ensure that people believe their testimony. Now they rely on the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. Now the thing that's not so clear is the seeming change in their authority to forgive sins. We don't find anywhere else in Scripture that confirms that men have the authority to forgive sin. Only God forgives sin. And sins are not forgiven based on the arbitrary whim of man, but on the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So what did Jesus mean? Well, it turns out this is a pretty deep rabbit hole, and I went down that hole kind of far before I finally pulled out. But essentially what I found out is that it means that based on the gospel message Jesus is sending them out to preach, they can confidently proclaim that those who believe the gospel have their sins forgiven. And those who reject the gospel have their sins remain. So because of the resurrection, the disciples' purpose, power, and authority has changed. Let's continue reading in verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God, Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So here we have poor doubting Thomas. I really think he gets a bum rap. Thomas placed conditions on Jesus to meet before he would believe. He had to touch the hands inside of Jesus. So a week later, Jesus once more appeared in the locked room and greeted the disciples with peace. This time, Thomas was there. Jesus spoke to Thomas, and he graciously met his conditions, and he told him to stop doubting and to believe. It seems that Thomas was so overwhelmed with Jesus' appearance that he no longer needed further proof. Thomas exclaimed Jesus as his Lord and God, and Jesus proclaimed a blessing on those who believe as Thomas did but without physically seeing him. Here we have what I think is a really helpful account of someone who tried to dictate the terms of their belief to God. If God will do this, or if God will do that, then I will believe. We've all done it. Many of us have prayed those so-called foxhole prayers. Sometimes God graciously meets our terms, even though he is not obliged to in any way. But the thing is, is that the resurrection is a fact. The words of the Bible have been proven true. Faithful witnesses affirm it for generations. Therefore, we no longer have any basis for unbelief. We have no excuse, no right to demand more proof. One well-known atheist was asked what he would say to God if he died and faced him after death. The atheist responded that he would tell God it wasn't his fault. God didn't give him enough proof. I beg to differ. There is sufficient proof. 
Thomas had Jesus' own words, and he had the testimony of all of his closest friends, and yet he doubted. You and I have more than Thomas. We have the entire scripture. We have the faithful witnesses of the saints. What excuse do we have to refuse to believe? What excuse do we have to refuse to obey Jesus' call to faith? We look at our lives and focus on the things that have gone wrong as justification for unbelief. I did. But do we look at the good events, the things that have gone right when they shouldn't have, and use those for justification for belief? The good, the bad events of our lives can just as easily prove, be proof for belief or unbelief. But the resurrection has changed the validity of our excuses. In other words, we have none. The resurrection has changed our purpose, our power, our authority. The resurrection has changed our relationships with the Father, Jesus, and each other. The entire narrative of our lives, the story of who we are before Jesus and who we were after believing in his resurrection that story has completely changed. We have new relationships, new purpose, new power, new everything. Jesus' resurrection changes the narrative of our lives, and that is our second principle. Jesus' resurrection changes the narrative of our lives. What difference does the resurrection make in your daily life? What difference does the resurrection make in your story? Do you still put conditions on believing in Jesus' resurrection? Do you put conditions on obeying Jesus? Do you still live like your life belongs to you and for your own enjoyment? Do you see other believers as your brothers and sisters first, or you do see them as white or black or Republican or Democrat or whatever? Do you see your life being about you or about Jesus? Jesus' resurrection changes the narrative of our lives. I know I'm running out of time, but uh, we'll move through this third principle or this third uh, division pretty quickly. So let's uh, pick up reading here in verse 30. John says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John reaches the stage in his gospel, and he can already hear the objections of his readers in his mind. John, why didn't you include this story? Why didn't you record these words? John is saying up front, he has not tried to write everything that Jesus said and did. He has been selective. John was the last gospel to be written. He was aware of the gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel. He knew what was in them. He's not trying to cover the same ground. Instead, John has selected the events he's recording for one purpose and one purpose only. So you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing, you will have life in his name. Here John makes an important point. He's not trying to get people to know about Jesus. Pilate knew about Jesus. Herod, the chief priests, the Pharisees, the crowds, everybody knew about Jesus. John says we need something more. Belief. Belief goes beyond knowing about something. Belief means that you submit and surrender to what you know. Belief, or if you want to call it faith, it includes obedience. John says belief in Jesus is needed to be saved and to receive eternal life. It's not about performance. It's not about the right memberships. It's not about what you know. That was the old system that people used for salvation. 
and many people still use it today. The problem is that we are all sinful, horribly sinful, and none of us can perform well enough, none of us can be in the right groups, none of us have all the knowledge to be saved. But the resurrection changes that. Those who believe that Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected will be saved. Jesus' resurrection changes the way to eternal life. And that is our final principle. Jesus' resurrection changes the way to eternal life. What is your plan for obtaining life? Life that extends beyond death. Are you trying to do more good than bad? How do you define good? Whose definition do you use? How do you keep score? Do you believe there is no life after death, and so you're seeking all the pleasure you can to try and pack it into life here and now? How's that working out for you? Do you find it truly fulfilling, or is this growing sense of emptiness in your soul that you can't shake. Jesus' resurrection is the only thing that provides real hope and real life. And the more time you and I spend digging in it and wrapping our mind and heart around the resurrection, the more we will understand it is the only way to eternal life. Jesus' resurrection changes the way to eternal life. Now, we still have one more chapter in John's Gospel. Next week, we'll study what some consider to be the epilogue of John's book, and John's going to tie up some loose ends in his narrative. But the resurrection of Jesus is the defining moment of history. It defines our identity. It should also be the defining moment of all our lives. The resurrection changes everything. It changes our view of death, of life, of eternal life. What situation in your life would change if you applied the hope that comes from the resurrection? Let's pray. Lord, we are, we are just overwhelmed by what the gospel, what the resurrection has changed. It has changed everything. May we not treat the resurrection with a cavalier attitude and say, yeah, yeah, we know about that. No, bring us back. Make us look at it. Make us see what it has done for us. May it redefine us. Lord, we are changed because of it. Thank you for your word. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, brothers.